Ryan, we're back. All right. Welcome to the show, Ken. How you doing? Nice to talk to you. Let's, uh, let's intro who we have here. We have Ken Pavia, super agent, the Ari Gold of mixed martial arts. <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> we're, we're definitely excited to have you on here, uh, me especially in the management industry. And uh, I have a couple questions for you unrelated to mixed martial arts in general. I know the history, especially from reading your articles on MMA Junkie and Versus. I'd like to know what made you switch from hockey and baseball representation to mixed martial arts. You know, what I experienced in hockey and baseball was no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you try, no matter what kind of relationship you establish, if you're a boutique firm, ultimately uh, you can't compete with the big fish. You know, they have just their, their reach is, is just too powerful and they have deeper pockets and they're more established. It's, it's a much more corporate environment. And what I learned is um, taking the skill set that we learned in 12 years as a baseball and hockey agency and switching over to the Wild West, which, we're, which was MMA, um, we could jump into a big fish role. And, and having been that small guy in a big pond for so long, the, uh, the allure of, of having the tables turned was very appealing to me. That makes uh, perfect sense. And now that your client list, if anybody hasn't seen it, they should definitely run over to MMAagents.com and check it out. You have one of the most impressive client lists, uh, if not the most impressive client list out of anybody in mixed martial arts. And uh, what we're dying to know is how would you feel as an agent, manager, friend, putting two clients against each other? It's yeah, often on two occasions, actually. You know, it, 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 it sucked. You know, I think it's actually happened three times in my career. And it's not something that I look forward to. You know, the, the first time it happened was a big fight. It was uh, Brett Rogers, who I was representing at the time, against James Thompson. And and I was very close with both guys. And James Thompson was the, was the favorite to win the fight. And, and if he was to win, he was going to fight Kimbo Slice, which was going to be a mega fight. And Brett Rogers was the undefeated up-and-coming fighter. And right after the fight, I wasn't in either corner, obviously. Right after the fight, I walked into the ring. And it was a, it was a big upset at the time. Brett Rogers knocked out James Thompson and they both approached me and I didn't know which way to go with it. You know, I had the, the, the agony of defeat and the upset loss from James and the adulation from Brett Rogers. And what I ultimately realized was, uh, in the rare occasion that, that my fighters do have to fight each other, stay away <laughs> as far away as possible because nothing good can come out of it. But, you know, ultimately it's not about what, uh, what, what's best for Ken's body. It's about what's best for the fighters and the rest it will take care of itself, I believe. And in, in all three instances, when my fighters did fight each other, it was in their best interest. It was something that benefited them in their careers and it made sense to them. So, so I, I, I articulated my my position and then made them ultimately made, let them make the decision. Okay, all right, understood. And being in the position that you're in, where you talk to these gentlemen, you know, many times throughout the week, and you have close, you know, you bond with these guys. You talk to them a lot, and your friends. Is it a hard position to be in when you have your guy up there that's your friend and you see him getting beat on and, you know, it's that pit in your stomach when you feel mm. that not only is your friend going to lose but your client? Yeah, you know, it's I don't do drugs, but I understand them. You know, part of the reward of, of being an agent in the sport is you get to experience the high highs and the low lows. And it's a, it's a veritable roller coaster, and it can happen multiple times on one card. You can have three really big wins and one loss and still a, you end up in a low. But, you know, for, for every time you see one of your guys get beat up, hopefully there's two times when they actually beat your opponent up and you get the experience, you know, we live for the highs. But, you know, I, I had one fight in particular where Phil Baroni was supposed to win in Hawaii against Powell Hose, went out there and smashed him for the first round and hit, I ran out of gas. And it was a very, it was a very trying four, three rounds to watch, you know. Um, you know, you want to throw in the towel, but you don't want them to, uh, get upset with you afterwards because, you know, especially a guy like Phil, will probably kill you if you threw the towel, but, you know, he's always got that puncher's chance. He's always got one in his pocket, the one-and-done power that can end the fight. So, you know, it, it is difficult, but, you know, for every every loss, you know, you, you try to balance that out with multiple wins and, and, and get to enjoy the highs. Yeah, wow. all right. So, I mean, it's definitely an exciting thing. And with that all said, uh, let's move over to the tournament that we have coming up that's starting this weekend. We'd love to hear your feelings on that. Um, I think it's great for the sport. You know, just a, it's a phenomenal tournament, and you have probably six six guys that have a legitimate shot, and two guys that 
you know, that are that have a long shot but can still win it. You know, I just uh, I'm, I'll be glued to the television side as a fan, um, and I, I can't wait to see how it plays out. You know, very often in tournaments, though, the best fighter doesn't win. Time and time again, we've seen you know the variables of injuries and guys coming off of tough fights, other guys breeze through. I think it was a four-man tournament. Um, the Strike Force had one night where Jorge Santiago defeated Sean Salmon quickly, and Trevor Prangley and Salonico Vitali had a war. And Santiago came out and beat, beat Trevor Prangley in the finals. We all thought, you know, Prangley would, would take that fight, but coming off of a, a very difficult fight, uh, of being exhausted came into play. And, and, and I think even though the heavyweight's not all in the same night, you know, you're going to see guys come up with lingering injuries. You're going to see, um, guys not be able to train immediately afterwards. So, may the best man win, but that isn't always the case. Do you have any picks, you know, as a, as a fan, taking the put your fan hat on and make some four picks here? You know, I, I like uh, I, it's how do you bet get bet against Overeem? He just plowed through everybody, and nobody's even really given him uh, any kind of significant challenge. You know, um, Bigfoot's just so big and strong. I guess you know you got a outside chance if you can take it take it deep into the fight. But you know, if Overeem gets past him. I, I see him running, running the uh, running the tournament. I think it'd be very difficult for anybody to knock him off. And I guess Barnett got an easier ride to the finals, and um, I think Barnett would be a, a live second pick. And you know, as much of a fan of uh, and an admirer as I am of Fedor, I, I don't think he's big enough. You know, I think that you know his frame lends itself to uh, a big tool fiber. And I think as the sports evolve, I think the heavyweight is too big and strong for a guy who's. 225, 230, or a very soft 235 to compete against those guys that have to cut to make 265, like Overeem. So I like Overeem, uh, and then Overeem Barnett Finals, which is probably what the odds makers like as well. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow, is, wow is right. Uh, you know, uh, the other fight that's on this Saturday night, not the Fedor fight, the possible end of Andre Arlovsky's career, is that going too far if he loses? <laughs> I did, you know, it, it depends what, what uh, Karatonov shows up. You know, I've seen Karatonov look phenomenal, and then, you know, I've seen him look less than spectacular in, in, uh, in some fights, and in K1, he hasn't looked great as of late. You know, uh, Arlovsky's been a little kidding. Um, but, I mean, listen, he was handling Fedor until he made a, a dramatic bad mistake. Um, could it be the end of his career? You know, I don't think so. I think the money's too big right now. Jens Pulver's lost seven in a row, and I said to Monty Cox, you know, come on. Why kill a legacy? And he said, because in losing seven in a row, he makes more, more money than when he was the UFC champion. So to think that Andre's going to pack it in, he's getting the kind of money he's getting right now, probably far-fetched, probably not going to happen. But um, I, I don't count Andre out of this fight, you know. I think he's got a great skill set, and hopefully he'll be a little bit more careful tugging his chin and circle instead of back straight up. And I, I think he's got the skill to win the fight. And that will he? Uh, but he can't. He definitely can't. Okay, all right. Uh, I guess that's enough as a fan from the Strike Force tournament. As uh, an agent, a super agent, who what ha- what do you have coming up? Who's fighting soon? Who's fighting who? Is there anybody in the movies? What's going on? Well, we have uh, a, a number of fights coming up this month. I've got David Loazzo and Steve Lopez both fighting in the Palace card next week, which um, David Loazzo is fighting for the belt, actually. And Steve Lopez has a very difficult fight against uh, Fabricio Camones, uh, another former UFC veteran. So we have two really good fights on that card. And then I jet off to Australia for a long weekend and go support Chris Lytle. Uh, Chris lost his opponent, who's Carlos Condit. It was a big, big fight. And he'll be fighting Brian Ebersol now instead, who's a, a very, very quality uh, last-minute replacement. He's from Australia, so he has the home court advantage. And then, you know, we, we limp into March, which um, is going to be the single busiest month in my company's history. I think the most fights we've ever um, had in one month is 17, and presently we have 20 books. So you know there could be an injury, there could be a injury re- injury replacement, but 20 fights keep us pretty busy. I think you know this is the last weekend I'm home, and then I'm on the road for I think it's like 16 consecutive weekends. So we got quite a, quite a little stretch coming up. Wow. Uh, hey Ken, this is Ryan Ventura. Um, I was curious uh, because like I'm not in the management industry, and a lot of people that. Uh, listen to the show are not you know familiar with the business side of mixed martial arts uh what is your responsibilities as a manager and um what advice do you have for anyone that could be interested in this uh industry 
you know, I, I think that it's not, it, it's a lot harder than it would appear from the outside. I think a lot of people have the misconception that, hey, you just sit ringside, collect a paycheck, grab a couple of sponsors and call it a day. But there's just so much more than that. You know, we have the client relations aspect, which means taking phone calls 24-7 and being, uh, giving stage advice to guys that go through very difficult emotional times and physical times. Um, we departmentalize our agency to provide a, a multiplicity of services. I've got a very competent sponsorship department headed up by Will, uh, Will Price, and he has an assistant. And he, his job is to procure uh, ancillary income in the form of sponsors for our guys. I have a PR department headed up by Josh Davidson, and his quota is four interviews for every one that is a quota guest. And he's, you know, he's well over that. He's doing six or seven generally uh, interviews for our guys as opposed to the opposition. I've got a commission compliance department headed up by a licensed attorney, um, Nick Walton, who handles medicals, travel, uh, execution of promotional and bond agreements. Um, I've got uh, Nate Broadnax, who basically runs the office and, and works long, long hours and uh, handles a lot of the accounting, but also manages the staff. We have a couple interns that are always uh, legal interns. Um, Nate's a law lawyer, also a licensed attorney, and a couple legal interns that are in the third year of law school that are constantly in the hustle, and then in-house counsel, um, Mike Lynch, formerly president of WAMA. So, you know, we got a very, uh, our office at any given time, um, you know, we're, we all work long hours, 12 hours in the office, and then our phones don't go off at night. So, uh, wow. you know, it's a, it's a long hours, um, pay's not great yet, we're hoping that'll change, um, because, you know, we, we fight, we fight the power, and the power fights us, and, uh, we give a lot to our clients, we feel like, and uh, we give a little bit back. So um, what advice do I give to people getting in, uh, getting education? I think at this stage of the game, um, a law education is kind of uh, paramount to, to providing competent representation. I think you have to have that background. And then cultivate interpersonal skills. You know, you got to not be afraid to work and hit the ground and, and socialize. Right on, right on. Now, uh, we don't want to keep you for very long, Ken, because we know you're a very busy man. Um one of my last questions is, um, what is your relationship with your client, War Machine? Um, with him being locked up currently right now, um, how is he doing? And, um, you, you know, um, what have you been doing to help him out in his hard time? Uh, War Machine is a client and a friend. I think he's a really, really a great guy. He's got a big heart. And, you know, when, when you're down with War Machine, he's down with you. And, um, you know, I think that he has, he's had a very difficult life. You know, he lost his father dramatically in his arms when he was a kid and, I think his life, his mother didn't react well to that. I think his life took a uh, evil turn, and and um, he did what he could to uh, get attention. And I think it was a lot of immaturity. And hopefully, he learns from that, and his stay in jail will um, mature him and make him a better person. But you know, I consider him a good friend, and I can't wait for him to get out because uh, he wants to resume his career. And I think he's got a new focus and new purpose, and appreciates life a little bit more, and appreciates freedom, and understands you got to make sacrifices too to make the right choices in life. All right. Ken, thank you so much. I uh, also want to thank you for an earlier interview we did with Phil Baroni on this show, which was one of the best interviews that the show's ever had. So, yeah. uh, Phil, Phil's a quality interview. He's very quick-witted. He's, he's a great guy. Yeah, he is a great guy. And being from New York, uh, I'll always have my heart with him. But uh, thank you very much for your time. Get some rest. 16 weeks in a row does not sound like a lot of fun. And uh, oh. say hi to everybody in the office for us. I'll do that, guys. Thanks a lot.